Hi, today is Friday, January 28th, and the time is 9.01 a.m. The AB 3121 task force meeting is now called to order. Good morning, my name is Camila Moore, and I am the chairperson of the California Reparations Task Force. Before we begin, let us have staff do a roll call for attendees and establish whether we have a plan. Parliamentarian John? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Chair Moore? Present. Vice Chair Brown? Present. Member Bradford? Present. Member. Okay. Member Grills? Present. Member Holder? Present. Member uh, Joan Sawyer? Here. Member Lewis? Present. Member Tamaki? Here. Member Montgomery Stepp? Here. Madam Chair, the task force consists of nine members. Five members are needed for a quorum. We have nine members present and we have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Members of the task force and members of the public, welcome to the second day of our January hearing where we've been discussing discrimination in technology and different aspects of health, including physical health, mental health, and public health. From a review of the agenda, you can see that it is a full one. And so to ensure that we complete everything during the time allotted, we will need to make sure that we follow the timeline established. So at this moment, it's 9.03, and I'll turn to Ms. Aisha Martin-Walton and, and Ms. Hurtado so that we can move on to our next agenda item, which is the public comment period, which will last until 10.03, and each speaker has three minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moore, Task Force members, and members of the public. My name is Aisha Martin Walton. I am with the Department of Justice and the task force would like to hear your public comments. The public comment period will be for one hour and each person will have three minutes. Please be advised that in fairness to everyone at the three minute mark, you may be politely interrupted and your microphone turned off. However, please know that there is a public comment period during each meeting and the task force encourages everyone to participate. You may also submit written comments to the task force members at any time via email at reparationstaskforce.doj.ca.gov. To participate in public comment this morning, please use the raised hand function. Locate the button on the upper right hand side of the screen. On the sidebar, you will see the shape of a hand. Click on that hand to prompt the raised hand feature. On our end, we will accept your raised hand. Then you will see a notification at the top of the screen to continue. You will have to click continue. You will then be elevated into the meeting um, as a presenter and automatically muted until it is your turn to speak. And at that point, you will have also have the option to turn on your camera if you choose to do so. Please note that there is a 20 second delay between the attendee and presenter mode. So please keep that in mind as you're being promoted. At the conclusion of your comment or the three minute mark, you'll be muted again and returned back to the level of attendee. We will accept the raise hand feature as they come in. And once the person in front of you is done speaking, Trini Hurtado, also with DLJ, will say your name and prompt you to in and that will be your indication to begin speaking. So with that, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Trini. Um, do we have a first speaker? Uh, good morning, yes. The first speaker is Angela Nirvana. Angela, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. You can uh, control your own microphone and camera. Noise. They're working outside my home. The first time I heard the term was from Hillary Clinton, who also referred to us as welfare queens. Then I heard it from Biden on the Senate floor for his 94 crime bill that Bill Clinton made law, which is why nationally one in 81 freedmen adults in the U.S. is serving time in state prison, in Wisconsin one in 36. 
And now Jen Psaki said Biden is prepared to be more tough on crime than even Trump by giving $350 billion to the militarized race soldiers to patrol Friedman streets and execute us with immunity. Not social justice and economic inclusion for Friedman, but Biden earmarks $350 billion to employ more race soldiers while our elected officials scratch their heads as to why black crime and murder are on the rise and freedmen who can't afford to leave the Chiracs throughout the country are begging for more police. I know you can't control what your speakers say, but it pains me to hear Brown included in our data as much as flat blackness does. The Democrats have made their plans to neutralize us economically, our albatross, and it's highly insulting that we can't even have a conversation or policy specific to us without the immigrant class being tethered to it. And yet when Biden gives away our reparations and protections to them, it's exclusively about them. Shout out to State Secretary Weber for making it crystal clear the reparations is for freedmen who descend from U.S. chattel slavery. The ancestors truly spoke through her expose yesterday. One of the speakers praised Evanston reparations. Why? 16 recipients received a housing voucher as a down payment for a home or home repairs. The median home price in Evanston is $325,000. The median income is $38,000. Can they even qualify for a home loan? It's insulting to lock Friedman out of the reparations conversations and then pass this off as reparations. Speaking of Narcan and Cobra, <laughs> they've done the same thing to HR 40, with which the House is doing a four court press to pass this nothing burger of a bill, which Narcan and Cobra, pan Africanist organizations who believe Black immigrants who got CARICOM and others who descend from slave traders should be entitled. So our reparations are left in charge of disbursing whatever comes of the study. Freedmen know how to receive direct deposits. In closing, consider making a way for the 13% who've been legislated out of California an opportunity to return and thrive. If the state can afford to be a sanctuary for immigrants, they can afford to be a sanctuary for freedmen and make them whole. Make your public hearings virtual and tell your anchor orgs not to charge Friedman $40 for listening sessions and to stop putting limits on virtual participation. That's my time. Thank you so much, Ms. Nirvana, for your comments this morning. Trini, our next speaker, please. Consuelo, you have been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Consuelo. Okay, we'll go to our next speaker. Please. Daryl Rowe, you have been unmuted. You now have three minutes. The cumulative loss of black life due to cruel and vicious brutality, contempt and callous indifference, specifically in the utter disregard for black lives and bodies generally is incalculable. I'm here to offer public comments regarding the needs for a broad multifaceted system of reparations for all persons of African ancestry in these United States. The rule of law, the cornerstone of this American experiment demands redress when people have been wronged and the redress or reparations are designed to make the whole, the wronged whole. So the only reason we're here this morning is because of the deeply ingrained sets of beliefs that stem from a common source, ongoing and continuous disregard for the denial of the validity of the fundamental humanity of persons of African ancestry. One of the most heinous in instigations out of the West was this thing called slave in reference to its creation as slavery. One of its enduring effects was to seek to fully dehumanize 30 plus percent of the human population while holding harmless the perpetrators of this crime against humanity. The use of the thing called slaves served to justify the savage and brutal denigration of American life. Folks of African ancestry spent 244 years in one of the most virulent forms of bondage in human history, trafficked by almost all Western Northern European countries. After emancipation, Africans spent another 99 years in, in a socially sanctioned system of limited citizenship where terror and restricted access were the fundamental systems of control. Race 
fairly recent construct in human history with its use as a means of categorizing human differences and structuring societal privileges was coined to permanently place Africans in bondage. Race and its correlates, racism, have been used to describe, catalog, examine, and teach about human differences repeatedly in pernicious ways. So once race became the primary means of categorizing or classifying persons of African ancestry, it became a shorthand for inflicting misery, suffering, and contempt. All Black folks who wore the badge of darkened skin were subject to the same cruelty and neglect, whether their ancestors had been held in bondage or enslaved, or were recent immigrants underinformed about the insidiousness of white supremacy policymaking. Lynching, one of the clearest examples of the savagery and viciousness of white supremacy and its associated policies, was used to traumatize Black folks and is a foundation of historical trauma for persons of African ancestry. Lynching in its contemporary example, socially sanctioned police killings, is cumulative and collective. So those who never even experienced the terror, such as children, descendants, and other Black immigrants, can still exhibit signs and symptoms of trauma. In mental health, we see traumatic events as extraordinary, not necessarily because they occur infrequently, because they overwhelm ordinary adaptations to life. Traumatic events are seen as outside the normal range of a person's experience and, ex and constitute exceptional mental and physical stressors. Unfortunately, the traumatic events of our collective history were both normal. I'm so normal sorry, Dr. Uh, Mr. Rowe, I'm so sorry to cut you off in the middle of your sentence. Thank you so much. Trini, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Matthew N Morris. Mr. Morris, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. First off, I'd like to say thank you to everyone that's put their energy to bring this event about. I also give thanks to those that come before me that sacrificed so that I could be here. Let me start because time is short by giving the definition of the word humane. Oxford states that the word humane is having or showing compassion and benevolence. Now I'll follow that word up with accountability, the fact or condition of being accountable, responsibility, a moral obligation to behave correctly toward or in respect of, synonymous with sanity, trustworthiness, and rationality. Reparations would allow so many people to be able to find the truth in themselves and discover where they come from by the establishment of those resources. You cannot say that you care about children and then deny them their ability to know who they are and their ability to go back home once in a while. As a family, we ask, isn't it a blessing when the children come back home to visit? And when they come back home, aren't they supposed to bring back something, either wisdom, treasure, or love? That's what reparations would mean for Black people. The war-torn places that have suffered at the hands of white supremacy need their children to come back home to visit, to help with the rebuilding, to help in the chores, to bring smiles back to their elders and their family. Amongst the Black community, we have a valued word that means so much to us and our families, the cookout. The cookout is usually when the family comes together over a meal to love and spread goodness to each other. It's when the children can sit around elders and listen to stories of wisdom to teach them about values. It's when the matriarch can feel peace, knowing that the next generation will be stronger than the one before that. If it's in the nature of things to evolve, then the visible proof of an evolution in the Black community occurs at the cookout. I'll also remind you of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN that starts with, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, and also mentions that is essential to promote the development of friendly relations between nations. So I bring to you now for all the... <laughs> Mr. Morris? Yes, ma'am. Um, Please continue, Mr. Morris. Oh, thank you. For all the descendants of the Clotilda who had to live under fear of death, that they could not tell the truth, that they could not reveal the truth, that they came under here under false premises and under illegal uh, circumstances. For the descendants of Jay Lewis, who witnessed champion and legend with everything he had to a country only to find that country would betray him by taxing him for the very charitable nations he gave to establish faith and goodwill in this country. It is time to show the country that we are no longer selling for inaction and calling it anything but apathy. We can no longer stand ignored and call it anything but neglect. There is no more room for tomorrow will get to you when we are dying today. If we are 
we are dying for wealth. We are selling our bodies for it. We are ignoring our children for it. We are allowing our communities and our elders to suffer further degradation because we have no wealth with which to care for either. Reparations Mr. is Mr. the start Moore, of the yes, I'm so sorry to cut you off and you're in the middle of your powerful presentation. All right, oh, okay, yes, Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for coming today. Our next speaker is uh, Ms. Consuelo. We are going to... Consuelo, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Okay, I thought we had that taken care of. I'm, I'll go back to him. I, we worked with him. Hold on. The next speaker is Cam Howard. Cam Howard, you've been unmuted. You have three minutes. Thank you. The National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America and COBRA has historically stated that there are five minimum injury areas where targeted resources must be directed. Wealth and poverty, peoplehood, criminal punishment, education, and health. In regards to the very important health injury area, in COBRA on November 17, 2021, made a substantial contribution. On that day in Washington, D.C., on, on Capitol Hill, along with Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee and a diverse contingent of five other congressional leaders, we introduced our harm report entitled The Harm is to Our Genes, Transgenerational Epigenetic Inheritance and Systemic Racism in America, of which the author is scheduled to speak later today, Joan Kaufman. The conclusions to be taken away from that report are two, that the historical trauma that we have experienced during enslavement, during Jim Crow apartheid, and during this post-Jim Crow period has a present effect on Black health, not only mentally, but also physically through inherited epigenome modification. And two, that there are proven protocols that can be used to mitigate this inherited injury. In producing the report, we had six intended outcomes. One, inclusion. All discussion on health disparities of the Black community must specifically include the effects of 400 years historical trauma. Two, resources. Resources must be directed to mitigate the effects of the historical trauma at both the mental and physical levels. Three, research. Research on our community by our scientists with our practitioners with the aim of transgenerational healing of our community. Four, awareness. Governmental bodies must provide community awareness information on the existence of this reality within Black bodies and what we can individually do about it. Five, decolonizing health. African-centered healing modalities must be accepted on every level in the effort to heal our communities from the centuries of terror, trauma, and abuse. And six, which, which is a post-report contribution of the Association of Black Psychologists, ABCI, and that is to affirm wellness, intentionally provide the affirmation of the African spirit and the restoration of wellness in our persons, families, and communities. We hope that the California Reparations Task Force will enter the harm report into the record and urge you to intentionally engage each of these outcomes when developing reparation proposals in your final report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank you for your comments today. Trini, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Chad Brown. Mr. Brown, you've been unmuted. You have three minutes to speak. Good morning. Good morning, members of the task force. And I hope you all had a great night, came back refreshed again today for a second day of, of witness testimony and data collection. I only have two points to speak to today, uh, hopefully get them in in three minutes, but I know if I don't, Aisha will keep me honest. So first point is I just wanted to extend my thanks to Dr. Shirley Weber, Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, and Principal Author of 3121, who came yesterday and gave a very powerful testimony that I think made clear the legislative intent that she had when crafting AB 3121 and that language. She was just as clear yesterday as she has been throughout this process so I just wanted to extend my sincere thanks to her for her steadfast leadership 
And I hope that all commissioners that were there yesterday heard her very loud and clear. Secondly, I wanted to address a concern that uh, Professor Holder brought up towards the end of the meeting or right prior to Dr. Weber's uh, testimony uh, around the economists, uh, sp specifically Dr. William Darity and Kirsten Mullen. I submit humbly that Dr. Darity and Kirsten Mullen are the leading and foremost experts on black reparations in America. They have produced what is quite possibly the most consequential literary work ever produced on black American reparations in From Here to Equality. We are greatly benefited by having them as a resource to this panel. And although there was some discussion about what could be perceived as preconceived notions, or I think it was quote unquote conflicts of interest, what I heard yesterday from Dr. Weber squarely aligns with what is laid out by Dr. Darity and Kirsten Mullen. And so I see their interests as not being in conflict, but being in support and being an amplification of what this body was convened to do. So I would just caution the, the task force and say that we should not be foolhardy and throw away what is potentially our greatest resource in Dr. Darity and Kirsten Mullen, who have been doing this work in this space for decades and are, I can't think of a, another set of economists or consultants to this task force that are more qualified. So Ms. Holder, directly to you, I have met with uh, most of your colleagues here and I've always yeah. offered them a copy of From Here to Equality if they don't have one in their library. And so I just wanted to take this moment to extend that same offer to you. I am very willing to send you a copy. I think that the deep dive that we must do is to engage with their work very honestly and very sincerely. And so with that, I'll yield the rest of my time and have a great meeting today. Thank you, Mr. Brown. All right, Trini, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Friday Jones. Friday Jones, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Good morning, I'm Friday Jones. My name is Kansa Jones Muhammad. I am co-chair of the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants and the LA chapter and a founding member of uh, the Coalition for Just and Equitable California. Yesterday, Commissioner Holder made a motion to dive deeper into the backgrounds of economists being selected for a special group. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but are Dr. William Darity and Kirsten Mullen not consultants for this task force and have they not already been vetted by the Department of Justice? This group has also been limited to economists when social scientists like John Rochester, the author of The Black Tax, whose body of work actually supports of this historic claim for reparations. Um, I would advise that this commission tread lightly um, in this particular space. Two days ago, there was a Twitter space hosted by someone named Mel with a hashtag secure the tribe with a question posed, does immigration benefit black Americans? This room lasted over 14 hours and had over 24,000 participants from around the world. It was the first time that the descendants of US chattel slavery were centered in a historic conversation about immigration on a large scale. What became abundantly apparent through the allyship established in that space is that people are overwhelmingly ignorant about the history of the American Negro in relation to America's immigration policy. My goal is not to harp on the merit of immigration, but it is a tool of white supremacy. And I want to further the concepts established by Dr. Shirley Weber yesterday to secure the tribe, the beneficiary class, to reparation. Were your ancestors subject to the three-fifth compromise at the United States Constitutional Convention of 1787? Were your ancestors subject to the Casual Killing Act? Were your ancestors African or of African descent and enslaved in the United States? Were they subject to the hereditary slavery laws from 1776 to 1865? Were mm -hmm. they subject to California Fugitive Slave Act of 1852? Were your ancestors subject to the Emancipation Proclamations 
that resulted in the establishment of the Freedmen Bureau under the War Department for Refugees, where your ancestors enlisted as Negro Union soldiers during the Civil War and or received pensions under the general law pension system of 1862, where your ancestors depositors in the Freedmen Bank, were your ancestors subject to convict leasing and black codes and Jim Crow laws? Were your ancestors' grandparents part of what is now known as the Great Migration from 1910 to 1970? Were your ancestors' grandparents or parents subject to Plessy versus Ferguson and or Brown versus the Board of Education? Lineage-based reparation can be derived from the overwhelming laws endured by chattel slaves in the United States and their descendants. This is the work that the task force must do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Trini, our next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Hillary. Hillary, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Um, okay, great. Seeing if I can, okay. Hi, um, so my name is Hillary Bridges um, and I'm just gonna speak more about personal experience. Um, so growing up, I, I truly hated being black. Um, I thought I was hideous. I had completely bought into this line of black inferiority. And the thing I wanted the most in the world was to be white. I thought white was prettier, better, smarter, just everything. Um, and so it's been proven that a high self-concept is correlated with success, um, strongly correlated with success. And um, so now through my mid thirties, I've had spent countless hours in therapy trying to undo these beliefs beliefs that I had my entire life. Um, and I have to say that having access to black women therapists has been invaluable, although it's also been expensive. Um, and so I just want to emphasize um, that this happens also like across socioeconomic status. My parents went to Harvard. I had all of the privileges in the world. I had academic encouragement and self-esteem. Um, and even that could not win against my fight, this fight of internalized racism. Um, and so though, although I have largely overcome my self-hatred, I'm super proud to be black. I'm like amazingly proud of my ancestors, love my history. Um, you know, the world also continues to remind me how I'm viewed societally every day. And these microaggressions, which really are traumas, um, are, are really violent. And so just for being black, we're constantly under mental and then therefore also physical, both, um, and they're also related to each other and influence each other, um, attack. And then we are also responsible for the costs that are associated with these traumas, both financial and, and otherwise. And, and also the traumas that are, um, that the black people around us experience. And so for that reason, I'm extremely in favor of reparations aimed at healing racial stress and trauma. Um, and such initiatives are in fact way, way, way overdue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bridges. Thank you for your comments today. Trini, our next speaker. Our next speaker is Marcus Champion. Mr. Champion, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, continue, please. Good morning, Task Force members. Uh, this is Marcus Champion. I'm a board member for CJAC, Coalition for Adjusting and Equitable California and NAASDLA. Uh, I'd like to start off thanking Dr. Weber for her comments yesterday making it clear who the eligible party should be for reparations. Uh, also would like to encourage the task force again to get Professor Erwin Chemerinsky out of Duke to put the legal bow in, in terms of who the eligible party should be. Because as uh, Professor Chemerinsky has said on our show, Politics in Black, the eligible part, this cannot be a racial designation. It has to be specific by lineage, which AB 3121 is. Because if it is not, we are open to vulnerabilities to Prop 209 as well as equal protection laws. Uh, also, I would like to speak on the proposed super team to perform, to perform reparations calculations. Uh, you have Dr. William Darity, uh, Kirsten Mullen, as well as Thomas Kramer. That is a super team when it comes to reparations. Uh, two of the proposed uh, members have already been vetted. They've been uh, expert. Uh, they've given expert witness testimony, as well as Dr. Darian Mullen have been consulted. So that saves the DOJ money since they've already been vetted. Uh, and that brings me to my next point about member holders' concerns and needing to do a deep dive on the uh, team members. I I'm not quite sure the need for the deep dive because that same concern wasn't given to Dr. Derek Hamilton 
and his views on reparations because Dr. Hamilton does have specific views when it comes to reparations. Uh, mm -hmm. Lastly, I would like to ask this body to exercise its formidable power and to lend its support behind AB 1604, which is in the California legislator, legislation currently, and that is a bill that has language that will disaggregate the data for black people and better collected data will allow us to better serve our communities, as well as ACA 3, which will end involuntary servitude in the state of California. And finally, if they would send a, a letter to encourage the president to execute an executive order with the same improved language of eligibility like AB 3121, because as we know, HR 40 has an ambiguous racial designation that would open it up to violations of equal protection. So thank you for your work and keep it up. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Champion. All right, uh, Trini, our next speaker. The next speaker is Jihan McDonald. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Good morning. What I would like to add to this is just a consideration that at the time of Reconstruction, when reparations were first kind of put on the table, part of that discussion also had to do with representation. And it had to do with the idea of self-governance among the Black community as part of what was being given back to us, um, of what was taken away. And so I really want to uplift the importance of us being able to make decisions from a culturally specific place about how things happen for us. And I really want to challenge uh, an idea and. I think something that comes up as a norm of the idea of success meeting the cultural expectations of essentially white culture. And so measuring success by often capitalistic standards and things that don't really connect us back to where we come from as people and what our cultural priorities and values are. Um, so that's one piece that I want to name, um, but that alongside with that, it also has to show up in actual money and dollars because in this country, that is what translates to representation. That's what translates to access. That's what translates to representational, representational power. So just wanting to have both of those be in the conversation that yes, there is something to um, achieving, striving, having success metrics in the world as it is, but also really wanting to bring in redefining and reimagining what success is from our particular lived experience and reality and priorities and what's important to us as a culture and as a people. Um, that's all I have to add for this moment, um, but also just to thank you for doing this work because y'all have a, a lot of it um, and lots of gratitude for that. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Thanks for your comments. Our next, our next speaker is Ernest. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Yep. Morning, Task Force members. Um, Ernest, can you speak up a bit? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Better. Okay. Morning, Task Force members. My uh, name is Ernest Russell, and I'm a member of the Freedman Agenda League of Michigan. Uh, my comments for today uh, are as follows. As a member of the public, I would like to disagree with Member Holder's comments regarding her discomfort towards the experts selected to be on the panel regarding calculations of reparations proposal. In my opinion, who is more qualified to discuss the calculation of reparations than individuals who have done calculations as it relates to the descendants of slaves and their injustices? We strongly agree with the economists that were selected by way of recommendation. I personally support the selection of economists who have spent their efforts collecting reparations proposals when no, when no one else was interested over economists with no inkling or background on the topic or subject. I also wanna take some time to thank Secretary of State Weber for her powerful comments regarding her intention to build, uh, you know, behind her intentions for authoring this bill and her beliefs on the community of eligibility. Uh, it is in that vein that I ask the task force members to honor those comments when crafting the reparations proposals for the descendants of slaves. 
Um, I also want to take time to agree with Chairman Rinsky's and Weber's comments regarding lineage-based reparations and, uh, you know, potential claims and proposals that are focused that way. As of, and, um, you know, one other thing I want to state is, as I've stated before, this is the time for you all to be bold for it is needed in order to truly repair the atrocities rendered upon Freedmen. I ask that you do something that has never been done before, which is be specific. Um, I want to encourage the task force to consider Dr. Weber's comments regarding Chair Moore's question on former Californians' eligibility who no longer live in the state and, the and also the possibility of including genealogy services and resources in your proposals. Um, I also want to thank, uh, take the time to thank some of the speakers today who have left public comment. And I also want to uh, echo Friday's Jones sentiments as well as uh, Marcus Champions as it relates to AB 1604 and disaggregating the data. And with that, uh, I am complete. Thank you, Russell. Mr. Russell. <sighs> Trini, do we have anyone else in the queue? Hello? Hello. Um, yes, my name is Eric Payne. I'm the executive director of the Central Valley Urban Institute. Um, we recognize California joined the union. Mr. Payne? Okay, sorry, he dropped off. Um, our next speaker is Jahia Matilda. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Um, hello, thank you. Can everyone hear and see me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jahia. I'll be very short. I'm a master's student and I'm writing my master's thesis about Black and Native co-liberation for reparations, uh, mostly about land-based reparations because of the ways in which both of our communities experience land-based violence in the United States. Um, I do first want to respond to some comments that were made earlier. Um, my grandparents uh, came from the West Indies to this country in the 1950s. They thought that they were fleeing the racism in the islands for the promised American life. Um, they suffered American racism. My mother grew up in the United States. She was born there. American racism is all she's ever known and it's all I've ever known. So the idea that uh, I or my descendants would not be eligible for reparations because we were enslaved in Barbados, but we've been in this country for a long time is very hurtful. And I'd like to remind the black community um, that we're a global community of black people. Um, obviously we're speaking about reparations in the Californian and American context. Um, but it's important to remember that we're not alone um, and we aren't alone in our experiences of enslavement as well and that um, anti-immigration attitudes and policies were a tool of our oppressors um, as well and it's really important that we don't repeat um, their mistakes and their evils. Um, I think when we're speaking about reparations in California we want to be specific about the um, American national context, but also what's happening in California right now. Um, black people can't afford to live in California right now. And I think that should be a part um, of talking about reparations in California specifically. What can we do to give black people housing so that gentrification is not pushing people out of their communities and changing neighborhoods um, and erasing us uh, from a state um, to which we very much belong? And I'd like to see a more general attitude of in, like inclusivity. I know it's hard because it always feels like we as black people are being asked to like make these steps and extend the hand and be patient um, when so much is actively being taken from us and done to us at the same time. Um, but I'd really like to see people interested more in building communities across um, other communities of color as well, because we're all in this together, like the American dream and the American nightmare. And that's all I wanna say, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Matilda. Thanks so much. Trini. Okay, our next speaker is John Mudd. Mr. Mudd, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Hello. Hi. Um, I wanted to talk about the eligibility and then talk about the economists. Um, the people want specificity. The scholarship seems to be pointing towards the need for specificity. And we had Dr. Shirley Weber indicate that her intention, 
her intentions were for specificity. Um, but for some reason, we have people who wanted to go against the grain, and I, I really don't see why that is happening. Um, this is something that is um, has the potential to uh, be the beginning of a, a great change for Black America, and will probably go down in history. Um, unfortunately, uh, some heroes in our history are overlooked and need to be rediscovered. Um, but certainly, we never forget our villains. So this is to the people who want to, uh, who seem to be obstructing this process at this point in time. Um, I want you to, to, to think about this very deeply. Um, and I also want to go to uh, speaking on the, the economists that are, um, I guess, uh, being looked at at this point in time. It is my understanding that uh, at one point you had one economist, Derek Hamilton, who indicated that he could not uh, follow through with the, the scope that uh, Dr. Shirley Weber uh, presented in the legislation. And now we have three economists, um, and for some reason that doesn't seem to be enough, and we're critiquing uh, two people who aren't economists who are uh, on this team, but both have a body of work that shows that they have uh, you know, been a part of the process of coming up with uh, reparations programs, whether it's Thomas Kramer, who calculated um, the lost wages during slavery, or uh, A. Christian Mullins, who uh, co-authored the book From Here to Equality. Both of these people seem to be qualified based on their body of work, and I think that we should definitely consider them um, moving forward since uh, they don't seem to be in conflict with what Dr. Shirley Web Weber intended. Uh, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mudd. Thanks for being here today. Trini, do we have any other speakers? Our next speaker is Robert Reed. Mr. Reed, you've been unmuted. You may now speak. You have three minutes. Robert Reed. <coughs> okay, on to the next speaker. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the next speaker is Sharice Cryer. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Good morning. Good morning, task force members and community members. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Um, I just wanted to um, concur with what um, Chad said earlier. Um, From Here to Equality is an excellent book. Um, if anyone in the task force has not read it, um, I would highly suggest it. I have sent the book to people all over the country, to my mother. Um, I reached out to Chancellor Carol Christ at UC Berkeley and I sent her a copy as well because I'm a graduate of Berkeley. If anyone in the task force needs a copy, I'm happy to send. One, um, just please give me your mailing address and I will send you one. Um, second, um, I have a request if the um, uh, task force would actually call those um, callers who are calling in who are not from California. Um, the reason I ask because this is specifically a California bill and we have had a lot of input from people who do not live in California. This bill uh, may eventually impact them, but it's really impacting Californians. I actually reached out to my assembly person yesterday um, to uh, uh, follow up on some of the actions that were taken yesterday by the task force. Um, and I think there's, you know, because of who the community is reviewing um, the actions of the task force right now, it's really California specific. So I think it's really important to identify a um, resident and who's not when we're um, asking for input for public comment. I want the public um, um, to listen to um, There's a lot of good information in there. There's a lot of questions that have already been answered. If you go back and listen to the prior hearings that um, some of the agenda items, they might answer the questions that you have before you come into uh, the new hearings every day. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cryer. 
Trini, do we have anyone else? Okay. Our next speaker is Kay Easter. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes to speak. Um, great morning, everybody. Um, I am calling to uh, speak to into something that I find alarming, um, especially given some of the events that happened yesterday. Um, I would like to see this be the last time we have a discussion in terms of who is you know, eligible uh, when it comes to this reparations justice claim as far as lineage goes. The fact of the matter is that the harm was done to a specific group of people, foundational black Americans, American descendants of slaves, and this is who this justice claim is for. The idea that we have to worry about other people when righting a wrong that has taken so long to um, be given the opportunity to right, um, the fact that our people are being, you know, wiped out and dealing with so much of all the ramifications of everything that they have been through in the state of California, I find it highly alarming and, and very um, sad that we have to have this conversation that it's almost like it's wrong to just focus on making it right for those people. And it kind of lends to a, the certain anti-foundational Black American um, sentiment in this country that has led to all of this. When our government puts aside funds for the Afghan refugees or sends money to Israel, it's specifically for those people. So I don't understand why there is this attitude that we need to um, worry about other people in this justice claim. It is very um, alarming and I think it's completely wrong and it, it, and it lends to just that idea um, that, you know, it's okay, if something is wrong with righting a wrong that was done to a specific group of people. Um, I also want to call attention to the fact that, you know, it, it also speaks to the, the thing that we've seen throughout history in this country is um, we have used, you know, foundational black Americans to build up certain industries. Like, you know, we even talked about tech yesterday and then we pushed them out. So it's, it's kind of, it kind of comes across as if other people want to crowbar into, you know, uh, something that does not involve them. If they have their own things that have been done to them, then they can create their own justice claims. So that's all I wanted to say. And I, I, I hope that we take that seriously and we don't tolerate an attitude where we have to feel that it's wrong to specifically, you know, um, make this justice claim about the people that were harmed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Easter. Excuse me. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Brandon. Brandon, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Hey, thank you. Um, I want to start by saying I think it's important to be on the right side of history. And it's really um, it's scary and it's messed up that people feel entitled to something uh, just because they move to a country and are dealing with the atrocities that come with it. When you choose to immigrate somewhere, you're signing up for everything that comes with that, the good and the bad. Uh, Black American descendants of slavery are, did not sign up to immigrate here. So to try to put yourself and center yourself in the fight, uh, just because you're the same skin color as, as those people, is very disingenuous. If your family immigrated to this country by choice, then you signed up to deal with this stuff. My people did not do that. And I would never move to Kenya and think I was entitled to reparations, nor my kids or my grandkids. If they said that and I was still alive, I would literally, I would whoop them. Wherever boat stop your family landed at was enslaved is who you are owed from. And we would never try to co-opt on their reparations. I don't see black Americans who have expatriated asking to be included in Jamaica's reparations. It's, it's the paralysis of analysis, as uh, Dr. Amos said yesterday. Uh, mass and mass immigration does not help black Americans. Data shows it. It's hurt us tremendously. It's been weaponized against us. Uh, this is not an all lives matter, BIPOC or people of color situation. This is for foundational black Americans. Why are people overcomplicating a simple thing? I'm confused. It seems like a form of sabotage. Oh man. Also, you can't do anything for a group of, uh, based on race. So it's, it's just some absurd point of view. And um, that's it, thanks. Thank you, Brandon. Trini? Our next speaker is Amaru Young. You've been unmuted, you now have three minutes. 
Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you, thank you. I just want to uh, reiterate what was said before me by everyone who is of the descendant community. Uh, the disappointment that you hear in our voices is because we feel like that, you know, everyone wants to continue to treat us as if we are their mule, as if the pain and the suffering that our ancestors, our people are currently going through should be given as free will to everyone else who didn't suffer those uh, consequences. Like the brother Brandon said, we did not migrate to this country to receive the treatment that we did. So in order to, so to center yourself and to make it seem like, well, you went through what we went through, it's kind of, it's, it's, it goes beyond disingenuous. It's, it's painful. And you can hear it in my voice how painful it is. Because how can you center yourself in something that does not involve you? We cannot center ourselves in CARICOM. Paracom did not reach back to black American freedmen and say, hey, we want y'all, uh, we're going to put y'all in for this justice claim as well. So it's just, it's very uh, erroneous and disrespectful to feel that you can do something like that to a group of people who has never received justice for the hurt and the harms that we went through. We listened to a woman speaking about, a, uh, speaking about Sims and the practice that he did to our black American women. Mm -hmm. How he how he committed these atrocities without anesthesia, anesthesiology, no anesthesia at all, and people want to shoehorn their way into that. That's wrong. You're being wrong. I would like for this board to dive into the criteria or what it means to dive in on these economics. What are we looking for? What are we saying about the people who have been vetted already, who have agreed to take on this task? This is a hell of a task. This is not easy work. So what is the criteria? What are you saying? What is uh, 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 preconceived thoughts, this and that? Please break that down for the people. And please understand that the people that you see in Lamert Park and Skid Row, they descend from those very people who have been crushed by a government who never took them, uh, 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 took their humanity or anything like that into thought. Those are who you're seeing. Those are the descendants of builders who built this country who are now 50 to 54% of the homeless with family. So for people to conflate issues such as migrating to a country and want to center themselves into a conversation about justice that needs to be done for those very people, you're wrong. Please check out the book, Back of the Hiring Line. Yes, immigration has been used as a weapon to hurt us, to suppress and oppress our wages, to exterminate us. Please also check in, board. I need y'all check into the ethnic cleansing that's going on here in America of our people. The world is watching California. So regardless of where you're coming from, the world is watching California. Black American freemen, the descendants of chattel slave, will not be everyone's mule. We can't stand it no more. We're dying. We're looking at 20 by 2050 zero wealth. Mr. Young, I'm so sorry to interrupt yeah. you in the middle of your Thank sentence. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Simon View. <laughs> You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Thank you, Chair, members of the task force for the opportunity to provide public comments. Uh, my name is Simon Vu. I'm, I'm here on behalf of the California Council <clears throat> of Community Behavioral Health Agencies. Uh, CBHA is a statewide association of over 70 plus mental health and sustenance use disorder nonprofit community agencies that provide behavioral health services to nearly 800,000 Californians. Uh, we work strategically and collaboratively to pursue public policy initiatives that create system change for diverse communities across the state. Uh, we support the integration of behavioral health, physical health, housing, education, and vocational rehabilitation services for children, youth, adults, and older adults. We are pleased to see uh, mental health listed as a priority area of discussion in today's agenda and the recognition that a focus on mental health is, is critical. Uh, CBHA and our member agencies fully support the work and mission of the task force and we stand ready to offer assistance and resources as you continue this important work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. View. Thank you for, for coming today. Rini, um, let's see. Our next speaker is Mariah. Lickenstern, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Thank you so much. 
In regard to the immigration sentiment, I want to personally comment that Black people throughout the diaspora have been subjected to institutionalized racism and the effects of colonialism. No one signed up for it. I'm married to an African witness the harms he endures due to racism in America. There's no escaping the harm of racism. We should not subscribe to a divide and conquer or scarcity mentality, but rather leverage our solidarity to create a movement of reparations worldwide. We can center the experience of the descendants of enslaved Black Americans without denying the harm to all Black people. The remainder of the statement is adapted from an essay published in the Black Women's Roundtable 2021 report. Please see the transcript of my statement and links to supporting documentation at bit.ly bit.ly forward slash B-A-L-R-E-P-A-B-3121. Now is the time to prioritize investment in Black people in a way that pays a dividend for comprehensive reparations. Reparations includes restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantee of non-repetition. This can be done by establishing a racial atoning compensation endowment, race, and corresponding race funds. While race should be centered on atonement or anti-Black racism, it should also inform policy to address broader historical and persistent harm caused by white national ideology, yeah. white nationalist ideology. This may at some point include a universal basic income, but it should begin with funding for education, skilled trades, upskilling, home ownership, debt relief, mental and physical health care, child care, social safety nets, and equitable access to entrepreneurial training and funding for American citizens and permanent residents of Black African descent with appropriate consideration and centering of the generational impact upon African descendants of chattel enslavement. How should race be funded? The fund should be established through a private partnership, through a public-private partnership, and consist of a management arm that oversees subsidiary funds. These funds can be city or county, theme or domain specific. Capitalization of the funds can include appropriations, tax deductible donations, commitments and or pledges from corporations and financial institutions, and co-investments by limited partners, such as CalPERS, CalSTRS, et cetera. It should thereafter be sustained through returns on investment and equity pledges from early stage beneficiaries. What would economics look like? The race fund would exist, would consist of a management firm for subsidiary funds. This management firm would collect 1.2 to 3% per year for assets under management, which would go to operations and reparations programs. Subsidiary Subsidiary funds can be rolling or closed end. The race fund would receive 20% carry on returns, that, on returns that will support sustainability and expansion with the remainder of returns going to launch additional funds and dividends. This would be an important step towards the trillions of dollars economists estimate Black Americans are owed for reparations tied to slavery. And these Ms. economic- I'm so sorry to, to interrupt you, but your time is up. But thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, Trini, before you call the next speaker, I want to check in with Chair Moore. We have six minutes. How many speakers do we have in the queue? Uh, there are five more speakers. <clears throat> Chair Moore? We'll take the last five. <clears throat> the next speaker is Robert Reed. Robert Reed, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. He had some sound issues previously. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Next speaker is Hubert, I believe it's Hubert Jackson, Jackson Lohman, you have been unmuted. You have three minutes to speak. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the work that you're undertaking. Um, I have very brief comments and I first want to say that uh, although I'm not a resident of California, I have many, many family members that live in California and uh, the decisions and the work that you're doing have an impact on African people, not just in California, but across the country, as well as the world. I stand with my enslaved African ancestors uh, and with those who, have lost, who were lost in the Middle Passage in support of the acknowledgement of the debt that's been owed to people of African ancestry 
by this country, not just as individuals, but collectively as a people. Communities are the holding environment uh, that facilitate our health and our wellness, and it is the institutions within our community that offer us protection, support, nurturance, and socialization. This debt can never be fully repaid without inclusion of reparations for the reestablishment of the institutions that we have lost, educationally, economically, politically, in terms of health, culturally, as well as efforts to support our healing and recovery through the provision of mental health resources to institutions that are owned by us, created by us, and based on our cultural values and operated by us. Um, if that is not done, this damage will never be addressed. As, as a people, we have experienced cultural genocide that persists with the continuing dismantling of our neighborhoods. We have experienced physical and psychological terrorism, persistent collective degradation of who we are through the promulgation of myths and stereotypes, failure to include our story and contributions in the curriculum of educational institutions, destruction of our communities, denial of access to resources that we are deserving as citizens, <laughs> violence at the hands of the state, and many other atrocities of the separation of African people from our land, from family and community, community has led to both health and mental health disparities. So it is time for a reckoning of, of this tragic history and reparations. We should not succumb to divide and conquer, but this should be an opportunity for us to come together to heal uh, from the um, atrocities that we have experienced, and that will involve compensation not only to individuals, but compensation to the institutions that make up our communities and that need to make up our communities and mental health resources must be a part of this package in order to begin this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Brini, our next speaker, number two. Uh, the next speaker is Alexis. Alexis, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. I'm sorry, I I I, can't, I yield my time. Thank you. Next speaker is Mens. Mens, you've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. Yes. Uh, well, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and listeners. Um, I wanted to first address um, what has you know something that was brought up that has been used against us time and time again. So I want to make the correction that um, <clears throat> anti-immigration is uh, not a tool of white supremacy. Immigration has always been a tool of white supremacy. Um, a lot of people now that, you know, uh, of course, after the Civil Rights Act of 1965, which we all lined, uh, our ancestors, black Americans lined up to fight for, um, has allowed people from black countries to come, you know, to immigrate into this country is now being said that white supremacy, you know, uh, anti-immigration is a tool of white supremacy. But we have proven, and even um, we can quote from uh, Martin Luther King's speech in Two Americas, he said that white people were given millions of acres of land and black Americans were given nothing. And that's because of loopholes and different policies and immigration acts. Uh, also, we can speak on after uh, the Immigration Act, what they did to basically um, take what was supposed to be written for us and supposed to help us, affirmative action, they used immigration again to, you know, which of course advantaged uh, white women, white uh, immigrants or who were considered minorities. Um, and they basically took everything that was supposed to create a leverage or an equal playing field, as such as us entering colleges, equal work employee or equal work, equal work opportunity, uh, being able to um, have a percentage of us that are in, the, in, um, in corporate America, um, other people have basically passed and used our, uh, you know, our bills and different acts that were supposed to assist us um, against us. And, and that's what, the, you know, that's something that we have to focus to get this right is specificity when it comes to this, when it comes to this particular bill. Right. Um, I want to mention that I know that a lot of other people in other countries have went through and had their experiences, but when we speak about sharecropping, convict leasing, um, Homestead Act, when we speak about Jim Crow, read some of 1919, denied education, redlining, peonage, the New Deal, 
um, giving interest-free home loans to white people, um, uh, uh, even affirmative action. Again, police brutality, um, origins of policing, such as the uh, overseers, uh, when we speak about the methods that they used and how they took free blacks and, and enslaved them during that period of time, how to use the 13th Amendment against us, when we speak about medical experimentation, when we speak about school to prison pipeline, the GI Bill, which a lot of us are victims of that, Devil Triangle, uh, when we talk about the crack that was dropped off in our communities, when we talk about black codes, um, when we talk about um, even California falls into this, heirs property, and confiscation of land. Most of the Black Americans' land has been confiscated because of that. We're talking about disenfranchisement of a specific group of people that does not include people from these other countries, that does not include people who weren't affected. We have all been affected. And even the people who, that, who are descendants who have not lived through that genetically, as we are finding out, are also com and, uh, compromised and affected because, as we've already learned yesterday when they spoke on cortisol, um, the stress hormone. Mr. So Mitt, I'm yes, sorry to you. cut you off in the middle of your, your statement. Thank you so much. Yes, All right. thank you. Thank you. Trini, the last two speakers? Uh, this will be the last speaker, Kim Mims. You've been unmuted. You now have three minutes. You are the last speaker. Hi, good morning, Task Force. I'm Kim with the Men the Mass Media, the digital advocacy arm for CJET Coalition for a Just and Equitable California. At the last Reparations Task Force meeting in December, I testified mm -hmm. about the insular nature, nature of the film commission industry. To recap, there are roughly 60 film commission offices throughout California and maybe one black film commissioner out the bunch. Still haven't received confirmation on that. The city of Sacramento recently adopted a film office into city charter, and as I mentioned before, I wrote a city creative economy grant providing a blueprint for what this new city office could look like. Several of my ideas have since been implemented into this new city office, and although I applied for the film commission position, I wasn't allowed to interview for it. One of the ideas I suggested was to provide grant funding for local filmmakers, which is exactly what this new city film office is doing. In fact, ETM Media Group received a grant to go towards producing Reparations Now, the documentary. It's a reimbursement grant, so we'll need to provide receipts before receiving funding. While the $7,500 in reimbursement grant funding will help with our production effort, it also shows the glaring disparities between racial, economic, and equities. The Film Commission position that I was excluded from competing for draws a monthly salary of over $7,500 a month. The entire situation exemplifies the economic exclusion experienced by Black Americans throughout history. Our ideas, our intellectual property, are repeatedly co-opted for the benefits of whites, while Blacks just receive a few crumbs from the table that we built. I say all that to say this. What's true, while it's true that Black Americans are resourceful and resilient, at some point continued marginalization and subjugation becomes too much to bear. This whole discriminatory hiring ordeal with the city of Sacramento was my personal tipping point. My mental wellness has been severely and adversely affected. I filed a disability claim as a, a direct result of this experience, citing drapedomania a mental condition assigned to slaves that attempted to flee captivity in the 1800s. My claim was denied, and the denial letter I received from the Department of Human Health and Human Services read like a chapter from the book Medical Apartheid, saying that according to their rules, they determined that I was sound enough to work. I filed an appeal stating that I never said I couldn't work and let them know that I've worked through this entire pandemic. I'm just not being paid for my work. I reiterated that I need a mental break from the systemically oppressive systems that are prevalent in most workplaces. I also let them know that Black mental health issues also often stem from economic insecurities that our trauma sh and that our trauma should be judged differently based on our unique historical experiences of atrocity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mims. Thank you so much for showing up today. All right, um, thank you all. That concludes our public comment for today. And we've reached the allotted time. If you are not able to provide public comment, we invite you to attend future public meetings.
or to submit written comments or testimony via email at reparationstaskforce at doj.ca.gov. I will now turn the meeting back over to Chair Moore. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Martin Walton, and thank you, Hurtado, Ms. Hurtado, for your assistance. We will now move to the next item on our agenda, which is the mental health panel. Uh, so I'm excited to introduce our esteemed expert witnesses on the topic of mental health, starting with uh, Enola Aird. Enola Aird is a founder and president of Community Healing Network, an organization building a global grassroots movement to help Black people overcome and overturn the root causes of the devaluing of Black lives, lives of white superiority and Black inferiority. CHN has put in place key elements of the movement, including emotional emancipation circles and annual Valuing Black Lives Global Emotional Emancipation Summit. A former corporate lawyer, Aird has worked at the Children's Defense Fund, leading its violence prevention initiative and serving as acting director of its Black Community Crusade for Children. She is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Barnard College and earned her law degree from Yale University. She was born in the Republic of Panama, Panama excuse me, of Caribbean heritage and attributes much of her vision and passion for the movement for emotional emancipation to stories passed down in her family about her great-grandfather, Samuel Aline, a loyal follower of Marcus Garvey. Then we'll hear from Dr. Theopia Jackson. Uh, Dr. Jackson is a licensed clinical psychologist who received her master's degree in clinical psychology from Howard University, Washington, D.C., and her doctorate from the Wright Institute in Berkeley, California. Dr. Jackson is a past president for the Association of Black Psychologists and for the Bay Area chapter. She is currently the chair of the clinical psychology uh, degree program at Saybrook University in Pasadena, California. Dr. Jackson has a long history of providing child, adolescent, and family services, family therapy services, specializing in serving populations coping with chronic illness and complex trauma. Dr. Jo Jackson is a co-founder for the Therapist in Residency Program in Oakland, California, an African-centered program dedicated to supervising Black clinicians in training and providing services grounded in Black psychology for persons of African ancestry. Additionally, she provides training for persons of African ancestry in emotional emancipation circles, a community-defined practice that is a collaboration between the Community Healing Network. Then we'll hear from Dr. Sean Yudsi. Dr. Sean Yudsi is a professor of psychology and chair of African American studies at Virginia Commonwealth University. His research interests are primarily in two areas, both of which are related to the psychology of the African American experience. First is his interest in understanding how race related stress impacts the physical, psychological, social well being of African Americans. More recently, he has sought to examine how trauma is manifested in the victims of racial violence. Other areas of interest include examining the influence of African-American culture on indicators of health and well-being. Dr. Yutsi has been recognized by the American Psychological, Psychological Association, Division 45, and APAGS for his work in the area of ethnic minority psychology and for his dedication and commitment as a mentor for students of African descent. Then we'll hear from Dr. Joy Angela DeGroy. Joy DeGroy uh, holds a Bachelor of Science degree in communication, a master's degree in social work, a master's degree in clinical psychology, and a PhD in social work research. Dr. DeGroy is a nationally and internationally renowned researcher and educator. For over two decades, she has served as an assistant professor at Portland State University School of Social Work and now serves the president and chief executive officer of Joy DeGruy Publications Incorporated. Dr. DeGruy's research focuses on the intersection of racism, trauma, violence, and American chattel slavery. She has over 30 years of practical experience as a professional in the field of social work. She conducts workshops and trainings in the areas of intergenerational historical trauma, mental health, social justice, improvement strategies, and evidence-based model development. We'll also hear from Dr. Christy Hagens. Christy Hagens has a multifaceted career as a clinician, educator, consultant, trainer, and university administrator. 
Currently, Dr. Higgins is an associate professor at California North State University and an adjunct professor at Allian International University, Sacramento. Dr. Higgins has expertise in racial stress and trauma, African-American mental health, multicultural psychology, and training and supervision. In addition to teaching graduate level courses, she provides workshops, trainings, and consultations in these areas nationally. Dr. Hagen serves on the board of directors for the California Black Health Network. Additionally, she has been appointed as the Association of Black Psychologists representative to the Leadership Development Institute Advisory Board for the American Psychology Association Council of National Psychological Association for the Advancement of Ethnic Minority Interests. Last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. Howard Stevenson. Dr. Howard Stevenson is a clinical and consulting psychologist and the Constance E. Clayton Professor of Urban Education and Professor of African American Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a nationally sought expert on how racial stress and racial trauma can affect every stage of life. His work focuses on how educators, community leaders, and parents can emotionally resolve face-to-face -face racially stressful encounters that reflect racial profiling in public spaces, fuel social conflicts in neighborhoods, and undermine student emotional well-being and academic achievement in the classroom. Dr. Stevenson has served for 30 years as a clinical and consulting psychologist working in impoverished rural and urban neighborhoods across the country. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Aird. Dr. Aird, you may begin your expert testimony when you are ready. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the task force, fellow we panelists. Cannot... Sorry, Can I can't see you. I'm not sure if you wanted to be seen. Okay. I can't see you. I'll hear you. Can you see me now? No. Now? Yes, yeah, we can see you now. Perfect. All Thank right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning again, uh, members of the task force. With thank God and ancestors, I thank you for this invitation to inform your deliberations um, by testifying about CHN's mission and vision and work. I, I would like to begin by, by telling you a story. And this story concerns a woman I encountered at a nightclub years ago. She was near the end of a very long night of heavy drinking. Looking at herself in the mirror in the restroom, oblivious to everything around her, she said, here you are, Dee Dee, old, black, and ugly as usual. Those weird words pierced my heart. And in that moment, I saw Dee Dee not as the 50-something woman she was, but as the child she had been. And I thought about all the little black girls and boys all over this world who for centuries have looked into mirrors unable to fully appreciate their own beauty, their own worth. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, somebody told a lie one day. They made everything black, ugly, and evil. That lie of white superiority and black inferiority essentially cast African people out of the circle of humanity, allowing for the continuous degradation and oppression of black people for more than 600 years around this world and 400 years here in the United States. I come to this virtual table as a mother in the long line of black mothers who for more than six centuries have brought our children into a world that profoundly devalues their lives. A world into which we have welcomed our children with great joy, but also with profound trepidation, knowing that they will carry the burden of all too often being seen as inferior and all too often feeling inferior. I'm here to call your attention to the lie of white superiority and black inferiority as the root cause of all the hardships uniquely experienced by African Americans, Afri Panamanians, Afro-Swedish, Afro-British, Afro-Pakistani, 
Afro-Indian people. The lie is the driving force that behind the centuries-long dehumanization of Black people. From the transatlantic slave trade, through enslavement, through Jim Crow, through today's continuing assaults on our lives and dignity all around this world. The lie is the reason why, in spite of all the constitutional amendments and legislation and marches and court victories and very impressive individual successes, overall progress for Black people just keeps stalling. So I join with calls for full and comprehensive reparations for Black people. But I also appeal to you to recognize that without intentional and aggressive steps in the form of emotional reparations, to promote healing from the emotional damage caused by the lie and to finally destroy the lie itself, all other efforts aimed at reparations for Black people will fall short. The task force has asked me to focus my testimony on my vision and passion for the movement for emotional emancipation. I really appreciate that. This movement, which CHN has been building since 2006 and which is CHN's way of charting a path to emotional reparations to repair the specific emotional damage caused by the lie. Quite simply, I want to help end the multi-generational suffering of Black people caused by a lie that promotes Black self-loathing and Afrophobia, a fear of Black people. The lie has harmed Black people around the world by undermining our individual and collective sense of self-worth, the well-being of our families, our children's sense of possibilities, and the harm continues day after day after day. The lie fosters an environment that constrains the human spirit and suppresses hope. It leads to tensions and divisions that often spill over into conflict. It contrib contributes to family difficulties, the opportunity gap, the epidemic of violence among our young people, the disproportionate incarceration of Black people, police brutality, and the many, many other challenges we face. I would like to share with you briefly the analysis that drives our movement, this movement for emotional emancipation. So Africa, the birthplace of humanity, the cradle of human civilization, and still the richest continent in terms of natural resources, was, according to historian Henry Louis Gates, the home of ancient civilizations as splendid and glorious as any on the face of the earth. But beginning in the 15th century to justify the buying and selling of African human beings to enrich themselves, Europeans erased Africa's rich history and replaced it with the lie of white superiority and black inferiority. The seeds of the lie were first committed to writing by Zurara, a royal scribe in the Portuguese courts. He described Africans as beasts with no knowledge of bread and wine, without covering of clothes, and worst of all, no understanding of good, but only how to live in bestial sloth. For many Europeans, the lie helped to resolve the inherent contradictions between Christianity and the enslavement of human beings. And for many Americans, the lie would also resolve the inherent contradictions between enslavement and the ideal of equality set forth in the Declaration of Independence. The lie said that everything that comes out of Africa, including its people, is to be devalued. And every institution of the Western world supported by unspeakable, often unspeakable acts of terror and violence was pressed into service to spread that lie. Marketing expert Thomas Burrell has called the lie one of the greatest propaganda campaigns of all time, designed to, and I quote, sell the concept that Blacks, Africans were innate, innately inferior, and that it was indeed completely justifiable to treat them as subhuman beasts. The lie imposed European cultural values on Af African people. Profoundly negative stereotypes with which we are all familiar, grounded in the lie, adversely shape the world's perceptions of black people and all too often our perceptions of ourselves. These stereotypes have persisted and the advantages conferred by whiteness and the disadvantages imposed by blackness have been multiplying over the course of six centuries. Because of the lie, much of the world believes that black people are inferior. That is our default position when we come into this world. The lie explains why black people are the only human beings who are often, so often, associated with apes. 
According to Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt at Stanford University, the co-author of a 2008 study describing this association, there is one old race battle that we're still fighting. That is the battle for blacks to be recognized as fully human. This dehumanization fuels implicit biases against black people in policing, employment, healthcare, education, and nearly every area of our lives with profoundly negative consequences for our health and well-being. Black people are amazingly resilient, and we have made extraordinary progress against the odds arrayed against us by this lie. But we have had to fight for every piece of ground, and the price we have been paying engaging in this constant struggle has been enormously damaging to us emotionally. A 2019 statement from the American Pediatric Association concluded that the the stress generated by experiences of racism may start through maternal exposures while in utero and may continue after birth with the potential to create toxic stress. This transforms how the brain and body respond to stress, resulting in short and long-term health impacts on achievement and mental and physical health. We see the manifestations of this stress as preterm births and low birth weights in newborns, the subsequent development of heart disease, diabetes, and depression as children become adults. In July 2006, the American Psychiatric Association Board of Trustees approved a resolution against racism that states in part, racism adversely affects mental health by diminishing the victim's self-image, confidence, and optimal mental function optimal mental functioning. That's who we are. Our self-image, our confidence, and optimal mental functioning, all diminished day after day by this lie. Now, it is truly amazing how much Black people have been able to accomplish while carrying the weight of this lie in our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and our bodies so, so long. But even more amazing will be what we and our children will be able to achieve once we take the time to heal and free ourselves from the lie once and for all. These are the basic premises of CHN's work. These are the beliefs that drive us every day. It is a natural consequence of a life of dealing with the pain caused by the lie that black people are inclined to be hypervigilant, always on guard. Black-only spaces provide a respite from that hypervigilance. So in all our work, CHN seeks to carve out psychological, spiritual, and physical Black-only spaces for healing from the multi-generational damage caused by the lie. Our weekly midday emotional lunch breaks provide a space for emotional refreshment. Our rapid response Ubuntu healing circles are designed to create healing spaces in times of racial crisis. And our signature initiative, the Emotional Emancipation Circle, is a self-help support group process originated by CHN and developed in collaboration with our esteemed colleagues at the Association of Black Psychologists, represented here today by Dr. Theopia Jackson, past president, and Dr. Christy Haggins, CHN's principal point of contact with the association. The EE Circle provides space for deep work aimed at, one, acknowledging and reckoning with the lie, Two, processing how it has affected our self-images, our relationships, and the well-being of our communities. And three, doing the work necessary to write our own emancipation proclamations with the intent of eventually working together to figure out how we can finally rid the world of the lie entirely. THN and the Association have planted seeds for EE circles in more than 50 cities in the United States, the Caribbean, the United Kingdom, Ghana, and South Africa. This is a movement that is resonating with Black people all across the diaspora, as it is providing spaces for Black people wherever we are to at long last name the lie as the most powerful weapon ever formed against us that must be confronted so that we can heal and end our collective emotional suffering. The fast-growing wait lists for CHN's programs tell us that an increasing number of Black people are looking for spaces specifically focused on healing from the lie. I wish you could hear the stories as people uh, come together in these spaces. 
the ways they are able to unburden themselves in the circles. But as I'm sure you will understand, what happens in our circles must stay in our circles. But I can share with you some of what people have said publicly about them. And in my references in my written statement, I will include links to two video interviews of EE Circle participants in Baltimore, Maryland, and Brixton, London in the United Kingdom. But here roughly excerpt, excerpted from those interviews are just three statements from people as they come into the EE Circle experience. Statement number one, I wanted something new that it would allow for some healing. I wanted to be a part of something that was honest, trusting, and safe because I came from experiences in corporate America where I had to suffer at the hands of white males who looked at me as a sex object. Statement number two, every day we're going into schools, still having to talk about light skin, dark skin issues, hair issues, how big are my lips issues. We still have that tape playing in our heads that we are not as good as the dominant culture. Statement number three, I work with young people who are such media consumers, they're buying into the lies about who they are, how they talk, how they dress, how they behave, how they think. They're being sold these things and consuming them blindly. And here are three statements from people after they've begun the journey toward freedom from the lie. Statement number one, it gives us a time to vent and let things out that we have held in for so long. Statement number two, by attending the circle, it provided me with a cushion. Things can get very hectic in our lives through microaggressions that may be happening. It's good to go somewhere and be heard about those negative emotions inside and discuss with like-minded people how we feel. Statement number three, I love the circles because they're safe. They're letting me unpack years and years of painful things taught to me in direct and covert ways about me and my race. And we're coming to the truth of the beauty of our blackness. It is a beautiful and deeply moving experience to see the transformation in our people as they realize that they have been lied to, that they are not what the lie says they are, and that they can change the 600-year-old narrative from one grounded in the lie of black inferiority to one driven by the truth of black humanity. This work of emotional reparations cannot be accomplished solely with cash payments to individuals. More audacious creative solutions are needed. This work must and will be led by black people. The sympathetic government can help immeasurably by launching and sustaining big transformative initiatives that one, acknowledge the depth and the breadth of the emotional harm that has been done by the lie. Two, Apologize and ask for forgiveness for its part in promulgating the lie. Three, generously support the work of individual, family, and community healing initiatives focused on the lie and everything else that needs to be healed within our community. Four, recognize that the lie is the thread that runs throughout the whole fabric of systemic anti-blackness and work to remove every single thread one by one from every single system. Five, generously support comprehensive and highly visible public education campaigns aimed at raising awareness about the continuing power of the lie and ways to extinguish it. Six, recognize that this is more than a matter of racial justice, but rather a matter of black people reclaiming our rightful place in the circle of humanity. And seven, acknowledge the need for good government and people of goodwill to do everything in their power to heal the harm and extinguish the lie in order to be, welcome black people back into the circle of humanity. CHN is happy to work with the task force and all parties interested in advancing the work of emotional reparation. As a mother in the long line of black mothers who are bringing our children into an increasingly hostile world, I urge you to urgently help us end the unique suffering caused by this lie, so that our precious children can finally move beyond surviving, flourishing. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Aird, for that 
moving uh, expert testimony, we will now turn to Dr. Theo Jackson. Uh, Dr. Jackson, you may begin your expert testimony when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. I'll wait for the slides to go up as well. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and I want to commend the work of the task force and your contributions already to the psychosocial spiritual healing for our people simply in your listening sessions. Can you move to the second slide, please? So I just want to locate myself in this conversation. I want to give uh, a lot of gratitude as well to my dear colleague in this work, um, Dr. Enola Aird, for the for the opening she just brought and for the wisdom that's following me for the rest of this panel discussion. These are esteemed colleagues who will go into a deeper dive into various aspects of delineating once again, what we all know to be true, the impact of the lie or more specifically, what I would say is what is due to us when, it comes, when you think about psychological reparations. Because it's not just these institutions and what happened for us in terms of disparities with, with finances, it is a psycho-spiritual, multi-generational woundedness that we have had to contend with um, and are still contending with in various places and ways. So in my conversation, I'd like to invite the task force to step into what Enola sh shared in terms of this audacious and creative solutions to, ex to go beyond just deciding or, just, or considering who's due what financial compensation, but how do you leverage your authority in this decision-making in this historical moment to actually target the systems that continue to do harm to our people from a psychological, emotional, spiritual place. And I hope as you hear my conversation that you will hear some concrete, tangible, short-term and long-term aspirational goals. First, let me say, too, I want to appreciate some of the comments that came before me, particularly when people were talking about the need to hear more from folks within California. So I want to locate myself again, though that I'm in Maryland right now. My entire professional career was, in fact, in California, the Bay Area for about 35, 40 years. So that is where I was brought up and raised by the clients and populations that I worked with, both at Children's Hospital Oakland, which is now called UCS, UCSF. Benioff Children's, as well as the um, community folks who are, who are struggling with what is typically called mental illness, and also growing up within the bosom of the Bay Area chapter. So though I'm here in Maryland, I still consider myself bicoastal, and I hope that, that becomes clear and evident as I contribute to this conversation as well. So next slide, please. So first and foremost, when we think about trauma, which has been a very prolific term for us now, we know it's meaning that something abnormal is happening to someone and it can lead to lots of dysregulation, physical changes, psychological, spiritual changes. But I want to put this in deeper context, looking at the moment that we're sitting in now at the nexus of the COVID and the heightened attention around racial trauma. You know, the COVID set the entire world down and pulled back the curtain on this long-standing, um, ongoing, persistent issue within our communities, where we have gone through times where folks are trying to make us think we really lost our mind by saying that we're post-racial, or the mental health field professionals would say that when clients are presenting with concern, when Black clients present and they say they're feeling a certain kind of way when they walk through a store or, or feeling like, in their work setting, they're, they're being treated differently because they're black. Good intention mental health providers have also been known to label that as irrational thinking, a sense of paranoia, and begin to proceed that way. So in other words, they're contributing to this dis-ease that we're dealing with. And I offer these, these images as well when we talk about the evidence that we're still going through this. So again, in our post-racial society, there's such a preoccupation with the residuals of enslavement that even when um, good intended white feminists are wanting to protest their right to not be um, locked down for COVID, why are they pulling up an image, a black image of a, of, of a person who was formerly enslaved as their evidence that they're not slaves and they need to be free? Again, when the January 6th erection happened, 
again, the image, why are we seeing the noose once again? So these are all the messaging, the psychological residuals, the ongoing um, psychological torment and terrorism that our folks have been exposed to. Uh, next slide, please. So to be clear, this type of trauma has touched all persons of African ancestry, particularly those that we've been speaking about here in terms of treatment within the United States. They just may be in various places in terms of how they are reacting or coping with those stressors. Some of us have a certain level of psychological awareness, so we're able to sort of name what's happening to us and able to access resources in terms of um, family, friends, and even a good mental health provider if, that, if that's available to them. But there are many of us who are still unaware because we bought into the lie, once again, that everything is individual. So there must be something wrong with me. So they're taking all of this in and they're reacting from that. And this is what's emerging most times for what is called mental health illness or severe mental health illness here in the United States. Because I would say we need to be very curious and critically question and wonder how much of what's being presented is actually a, is, is a manifestation of the ongoing complex trauma, racial stress that we are exposed to versus someone's Western theoretical individuation of pathology located in the person. These terminologies I offer here for our readers to take in as I'm sharing this, but I also wanna honor and take in some of the work by a psychologist of, um, from the First Nations, Braveheart, who talks about soul wounds. What we, what we call multi-generational trauma, where it passes down from one to the next. And this is not, this is not necessarily a verbal um, um, passing down. I don't have to sit my children down and talk with them about racism so explicitly. However, they can still feel it in the nurturance of how they're being raised up. If I am not conscious as the mother of the psychological implications of racism in terms of how my children can be disenfranchised in school settings, the worriedness of, of um, being safe coming home with the interface with law enforcement. If I'm not aware of that and I'm really buying into everything is fine and we're post-racial and it's, everything's equal here, then I'm leaving them at a psychological disadvantage when certain atrocities show up and they end up internalizing that. I also want to underscore here too this idea of collective trauma. Once again, I may not have to experience my child being murdered in order to feel the pain and the risk of my child being murdered simply because of the color of their skin and because of someone else's um, pathology. I'll just name it that way. So this, there is a collective trauma for us. I think this also shows up for many generations of Blacks. If we say when, when something happens, we're like, okay, were they Black? And we take a sort of uh, an exhaling, if we real, if there wasn't someone Black who just did that major crime, because we feel that deeply. Also, when we talk about the atrocities during the time of enslavement, they happened in the past, but they're still living in our DNA and our spirit and in us. So we still feel it as well too. So I would submit to you the murder of um, Brother Floyd and, and Brother Ahmed and, uh, and others who've been named even recently reawakens the psychological trauma and pain of all those who were unnamed and taken from us to all the ones that we can name, have lost their name, but still feel the essence of them within us. So this is important because it's also laying the foundation, the realization that the systems that are designed to help alleviate such mental um, illness, if you will, or psycho, psychosocial or psychospiritual woundedness are not prepared to do so. At minimal, they are actually part of the problem. I wanna underscore the, the, the beautiful title of the California Reducing Disparities um, project that was done in 2012, where it was a, for, when you're looking at the experiences of of Black, Amer Black Californians in the mental health issue, they aptly so named that piece, we're not crazy, we're just in systems that are crazy. <laughs> so this is important. Next slide, please. 
So many of the Western systems um, predominantly are still very much occupied or preoccupied with individuation or the individual level of what's happening. But, this, but systems of oppression and more specifically systems of structural racism is in fact the dis-ease that has roots for many of our behavioral, mental health, psychological or otherwise. And it does in fact not only involve these messages, but as uh, my dear colleague Enola Ayer just explicated, they are the roots that feeds that type of thinking. This is how the lie manifests itself. So we wanna hold on to this and that level of importance as we continue in this conversation, because it also speaks to things like use of language. This is important to me all the time because when we say children who are at risk, then it focuses all of the attention on fixing the child. The funding goes there. It's the um, evidence for, for pulling a child out of a class and, and placing them in individual therapy without their families knowing. And this is one of the things that still happens in California that I'm very much aware of in other issues. But if we ask us, if we shift that and say, our children are at potential in at-risk environments, then the question becomes, what happened to them? What's going on in their environments? And this too is where I'm asking the task force to be curious about how you can leverage your positionality and in, in increasing and in impacting the environments in which our youth and families are growing up in as part of their healing process as that too would go a long way. This is also important when I think about, um, excuse me, I'm just having a little dry cough here a little bit, hold on. <laughs> This is also important when I think about the storiness that uh, Miss Mim shared early, and I want to appreciate her for her, her courage in, in bringing her story forward because I think it's a good example of our institutions not understanding the depth and woundedness of this type of psychological stress and how it shows up. And it too deserves the same um, valid attention, um, resources, and time off as any other um, illness, if you will, because most of what shows up as depression, anxiety, um, obsession, behavior, whatever those diagnostic labels are, I still submit that many of them have their roots in this unresolved trauma that we can continue to con contend with. So there's a proverb that says, the lion and sheep may lie together, but the sheep won't get any sleep. I want to offer that in the sense that those black psychologists and mental health providers who's been doing this work, there's no sleep for us. There's no sleep for the people who are in the grassroots, in the trenches, who have really been, and, and many of them you've heard on the call today and previously, many of these organizations and um, grassroots leadership that comes forward and they're doing the work behind the scene and for the people while still having to contend with their own exposure to this type of trauma. So it's black exhaustion is extremely complex and it's real. Next slide, please. So the psychological literature will talk about uh, when you're dealing or working with, within trauma and coming from a trauma informed care approach, it's really important to produce realignment after trauma. I beg the question, how can there be realignment after trauma when the trauma has not stopped? And that's the question we need to be asking critically. Again, language is important. There's a prevalence around the importance of resilience, our capacity to bounce back. And I completely get that and can concur with it. And yet at the same time, it can be weaponized against us because there's an overemphasis, almost glorifying our capacity to bounce back as opposed to saying what's going on they have to bounce back from and how do we stop that? So here, once again, I wanna underscore the opportunity for the task force to listen critically to the conversations coming through with my colleagues today and others. How can you leverage this in California to stop the madness, to stop, to get the, the, to get the knee off the neck so we do not have to continue to be resilient but have a right to live a whole, well, psychological, spiritual, physical, economical life. 
And again, when we think about the, the trauma, it talks about shifting the language from what happened to you, i.e. pathology, what's wrong with you, to, um, excuse me, from what's wrong with you to what happened to you. Is, so please allow me that correction. So this is what I'm saying. Mental health services providers, there has to be an accountability for their addressing the issues of what happened to whomever they're serving and how their services will meet and address those issues and move away from um, simply promoting symptom reduction and be more intentional about quality of life change. Next slide, please. So I bring these next two slides up uh, to just to be very clear about this very historical moment that we're sitting in right now. I submit to you there's a sort of a crack in the system that I think it's crucial for us and for the task force to leverage the conversations that you're listening to to help transform the field of mental health services. Because as this statement is showing, the American Psychiatric Association named out loud and, and said very loud and clearly that it too has been working from structural racism. Naming all the atrocities that many of us have known to be true about the disproportionate services for people of African ancestry, African descent, where they're more likely to be pathologized, diagnosed with, uh, with diagnoses like schizophrenia and others. They're more likely to be over-medicated, under-medicated, simply because of bias implicit bias and structural racism within the system as opposed to what's needed for them uniquely. And we see this because the literature has clearly demonstrated the evidence of the differences in treatment when everything else is held the same and ethnicity and or class are the variables that bring this forward. I wanna to read to you a quote that stands out for me quite a bit. No, historically, psychology has accepted whiteness as a standard or norm and presented other modes of being as marginal, unnatural, or in some way straying from the norm. This is what is being apologized for. However, it's not enough. Next slide, please. It's not enough because, again, if we look at the apology and the energy that's going on now, within the American Psychological Association, where they have list, posted their own apology. Um, I was actually part of the work group that was, uh, that was tasked with delineating the chronological history of all the damages that were done to communities of color. And I strongly encourage the task force, if you have not, to look at that document. But I also wanna to say too, this is all still incomplete and insufficient. Though I'm pleased I was part of it, but there's still systemic issues that gets in the way of bringing about genuine change and recognizes because the system is actually broken. Right? It is, in some ways, it's doing what it was intended to do. It, just like the, uh, the history of law enforcement in this country, the history of mental health was actually designed to strategically pull out and disenfranchise certain groups like black folks. So I like to say it's that the psychology and the mental health services that we have now are drawing from what I would call a poisonous well. That the, the, the hegemony, the very, the roots of how it was designed is still bearing fruit in how we practice today. And so therefore the institution itself cannot be solely responsible for changing itself. It does need outside viewers, outside um, folks like the task force critically looking at its role in this work. Let me just share one other quote for you as well, please, that, that stands out for me that I think feels relevant here, which is huh, the, the report, the California report, the California disparities report is prominent for me too because it strategically looks at the voices of the people, what are they saying about their mental health? And as opposed to listening to established systems. So though APA, both these psychological associations and American Psychiatric have started this, it is not their work to do and finish, it is ours to do. Um, next slide, please. Uh, 
And what, I, what do I mean by drawing from the poisonous well? One of our callers earlier referenced this diagnostic um, space, but, I, but this is what we mean by the residuals. They're still sitting here. This was what was the determined to be a mental health issue is the preponderance of enslaved black persons to run away from enslavement we diagnosed as pathology and prescribed the cure and its residuals that shows up here is the myth that is a cultural value for black families to beat their children when it is actually a social adaptive phenomena based on these 300 plus years of this type of behavior that we were socialized into. So we wish to note that treating perceived racism at the individual level not only applies a proverbial bandage on the insidious problem, but also further burdens the victim. The systems that may serve as the source of the discrimination should be aggressively targeted. From a systemic standpoint, medical and academic institutions alike can raise awareness of the negative impact of racial discrimination, systemic racism, and health disparities through didactics and trainings focused on diversity, cultural awareness, and sensitivity. But more, more specifically, the ones who are leading those discourse must be the people themselves. We must hear from our own communities. That, that needs to be central and privileged, as opposed to professionals coming in and saying, here's what we're going to do to fix you. We have to strategically listen to their voices. And I want to, again, underscore the work with the Community Healing Network, because the Emotional Emancipation Circles is a beautiful example of what health and healing can look like for our people, because it goes beyond simply formal therapy, if you will because not every therapy is therapeutic and not everything that's therapeutic is therapy. And as I alluded to earlier, and we'll say more explicitly as we, go, as we go through this talk, many of those who are trained to help in the mental health profession are ill-prepared, um, miseducated, and some are very intentional about their racist thoughts and attitudes about our people. And so when we present with certain um, symptomatology, if you will, or, or a context, we're, we're led to believe that the problem is us and not um, given a space to really look at what's happening to us and then also to critically review how internalized racism is impacting us and how we interact with ourselves, one another as well. Um, so next slide, please. So what we're really calling for and what we really need is a transfer, a, trans, a genuine transformation of the mental health field. And I would be remiss if I did not honor and raise up the work of black psychologists, particularly those who are the founders and members of the Association of Black Psychologists, and, and as well as other black organizations like the National Association of Black Social Workers, Black Psychiatrists of America, Black nurses, and the list goes on. What I'm wanting to underscore with this particular slide here is raising up the fact that these organizations have been doing the work together and individual within their own disciplines, yet we've been at a disadvantage because small in numbers, limited resources, and the, um, the systemic supremacy and domination of organizations like the American Psychological Association and the American Psychiatric silences this work. So again, I might would like to suggest to the task force that you are very intentional to continue to invite to these conversations members of these various groups, particularly those who are working within California. And I'm going to give, of course, a huge shout out for the Bay Area chapter, as well as our up and coming Sacramento chapter for the Association of Black Psychologists. And we have other chapters throughout. Just being able to help leverage the work that they're doing at a higher level is a valuable way to, to dealing with the psychological reparations of the enslavement um, Mayotte. Can we go to the next slide, please? Because one of its primary gifts is shifting 
how we think about trauma, how we think about illness. And I want to lift up the work of uh, Marimba Ani, Dr. Ani, who's, who talks about conceptualizing what happened to us in this idea of an African trauma cycle, where prior to the slave trade, pr prior to the trafficking of black bodies, prior to the genocide, the, the, the direct intention of genocide and um, trauma to, to black bodies, there was a period of, health, of wholeness for us within, within the African continent. It's our way of being in the world. We still had our own struggles, but they were ours to contend with. The Maya'afa is this time of the enslavement, and we are actively in what we want to call the Sankofa space where we must do our own healing. We must be the drivers of our own healing. We must be heard in our own.